visualizárselas al final de su presentación. Eh, las preguntas obviamente pueden ser en inglés o en español, ahí después él entiende perfectamente el español también, así que no hay problema. Así que adelante, la, la presentación va a ser en inglés, eh, pero Daniel lógicamente va a tratar ahí de, de hacerlo sencillo para con alto apoyo de imágenes para el, el público espectador. Así que bueno, Daniel. Thank you very much, Hessel, and bienvenidos a todos. Uh, I will go straight into Medias Res. I'm just clicking on the right button, hopefully now. I hope you can see my screen. No, where are you? Aha, uh -huh, uh, here you are. Can you see it? Yes. Sí, okay. sí, sí, it's, 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 yeah, we, we can see it. Yeah, I just, something just blocked my initia, where is it? Yeah, something just got blocked because I wanted to go to the slideshow. Let me just do it's, this. It's down, it, where do you, you see the zoom bar down? Yeah, yeah, the, I just want to go to slideshow because it was oh. blocked by something. Okay, from beginning now. Okay, can you see it? Yes. All right. So um, I want to talk or I want to introduce you to the world of uh, potassic intrusions and potassic magnetism and how to utilize their geochemical fingerprints and their mineralogy uh, when you are looking or exploring for gold and copper mineralization. And my presentation will be in four parts. Mm -hmm. First of all, I just want to find the highlighter. Okay, here you are. Oops, no better, probably the marker, laser pointer. Okay, first of all, I want to introduce you uh, what hypothetic magmatism means, actually. And I want to keep it very brief because, you know, in petrology, there are many uh, geochemical diagrams, but I just want to show you the most important ones. Then in the second part, I want to talk about the tectonic settings of these potassic intrusions because uh, you can use their geochemical fingerprints to uh, find out their tectonic settings, even if you come into ancient terrains, like where uh, metamorphism has overprinted them, and, but their geochemical fingerprints, they can still tell you about their original tectonic setting. And I will talk, briefly talk about that. Then something very important, the third part, I want to talk about the volatile contents and the high oxidation states of high potassic magmas because these two characteristics are very important, especially in mineral exploration. And then to conclude everything, I want to show you some examples of porphyry copper gold and epithermal gold deposits, which are uh, genetically associated with these potassic intrusions and just like a picture show, but also to show you their geochemical fingerprints and to discuss that. Yeah, so let's start with the introduction. What are these potassic uh, intrusions actually? And I will start with the so-called TAS plot, which is meaning total alkalis, sodium and potassium plotted versus silica. And you have this really thick line here in between. And that's basically the division between the uh, subalkaline intrusions, which are falling below this line and the alkaline intrusions where the potassic intrusions belong to uh, marked in gray. And the potassic or the alkaline rocks, you can subdivide them into potassic intrusions and into sodic intrusions. But for mineral exploration, usually the high potassic ones are more important. And the reason that we uh, should consider the more potassic calc alkaline and the shoshonitic intrusions in mineral exploration is that about 40% of the really large porphyry copper gold gold and epithermal gold deposits are actually associated with this high potassic calc alkaline or shoshonitic intrusions. And that is even more interesting when you consider the fact that only about five volume percent of all the magmatic products in subduction arcs are actually uh, high potassic calc alkaline or shoshonitic. So they are very rare, uh, but about 40% of the really large world-class deposits in terms of copper and gold are genetically associated with them. So they have a really uh, important role in mineral exploration. 
And I say that with great pleasure to you because in South America, uh, for many years, uh, everybody always uh, talked about the normal calc alkaline intrusions and everyone always takes it for granted that all the large porphyry copper and porphyry copper molybdenum deposits are actually hosted by normal calc alkaline intrusions. But it's not really true because actually the really big deposits like Shuki Kamata and El Abra, El Teniente, uh, El Salvador are actually associated with high potassic calc alkaline intrusions. So I will talk a little bit more about what I actually mean, just to briefly define this term. I mean, high potassic alkaline intrusions is basically an umbrella term for many, many uh, rock types, which are actually alkaline or yeah, alkaline rocks, which are pretty rare. And the high potassic, or this term includes the high potassic calc alkaline uh, tracky basalts or uh, end or Tracky uh, diorites, tracky andesites, trachytes, shoshonites, uh, even ultra potassic rocks, and lamprophires. And all these terms probably don't uh, mean so much to you. But most importantly, when you are a field geologist and you're doing exploration and walking across your uh, project area, you can uh, distinguish them or find them. They always have porphyritic textures. And usually with phenocrysts of uh, plagioclase or potassic feldspar, olivine, uh, clinopyroxene, and the hydrous uh, minerals like amphiboles and biotite. And amphiboles and biotites are actually the most important ones because they are also called the hydrous minerals because they fit all the volatile phases like water and chlorine into their uh, mineral structure. I don't want to talk about the um, silica undersaturated intrusions, because when you look for porphyry copper gold and uh, porphyry molybdenum deposits, usually you're looking for silica saturated potassic calc alkaline intrusions. And as I said, I want to neglect the uh, sodic parts of the alkaline intrusions. I really want to concentrate on the potassic ones. And just to uh, show you some backup for my statement that 40% of the really large porphyry copper gold and epithermal gold deposits are associated with um, uh, potassic calc alkaline and shoshonitic intrusions. There are many examples for them. Let's start here in North America, Pebble in Alaska, for example, Bingham, which I will show a little bit more about later. Then in South America, we have El Abra. It's a very good example. And I will talk a bit more about that later. Uh, Bajo de la Alumbrera in Argentina, Scurius in Greece, Shungun in Iran, Oyotolgoi, a quite recent discovery in uh, Outer Mongolia, Peshanka, a really large deposit in Siberia, which is not so known yet, but it's actually one of the largest porphyry copper gold deposits clusters, by the way, uh, which are just getting developed as we speak. Then, of course, the, the huge Porgora epithermal gold deposit in Papua New Guinea, the large Grasberg porphyry copper gold deposit in the Indonesian part of uh, New Guinea. I will talk a little bit more about that. And Lihi Island, which I know really well, so I will talk a little bit more about that, which contains one of the largest epithermal gold deposits in the world, just sitting in the center of a, a volcano. And then, of course, the Shoshunite hosted uh, porphyry copper gold deposits of North Parks and Cadia in New South Wales in Australia. Yeah, just to uh, talk a little bit about what forms these potassic intrusions. I mean, you all know what a subduction zone looks like. So I just want to emphasize some of the terms which you always hear when you when you read papers about petrology. It's always a so-called depleted lithospheric mantle. And why is it depleted? Well, the reason is because at the mid-ocean ridges, continuously you form tholaitic uh, basaltic magmas at the seafloor. And they, when they form, they deplete the mantle and all the elements uh, which are needed to form these basalts. So most of the upper mantle actually in the world is depleted. But there is one exception, and this is the subduction zones. And in the so-called subduction wedge, the normally depleted mantle, which usually consists of minerals like uh, olivine and clinopyroxene or orthopyroxene, but 
when you come in a subduction zone because the uh, uh, oceanic slab which gets subducted uh, is getting first dehydrated and all the water from the serpentinites from the um, from the oceanic slab slab they dehydrate and in the depleted mantle the olivine and the orthopyroxene they can't take up all the water contents from the uh, dehydrated slab so they have to form new minerals and they usually form richterite which is an amphibole potassic amphibole uh, which is actually really blue under the microscope uh, or usually more phlogopite and the phlogopite and the richterite they have to form new minerals and sometimes they form little patches in the mantle dunite which is normally depleted and these newly hydrous minerals they introduce suddenly elements which have a large ionic radius like the large ion lithophile elements such as potassium barium rubidium strontium but also water and chlorine and we know that because in some places uh, especially in kimberlites because they are very deep and when they come up they can rip up parts of the now enriched mantle and bring that to surface and you can study these mantle nodules as witnesses of the now um, enriched mantle and you find the, the um, really olivine and orthopyroxene rich uh, mantle rocks which are veined by newly formed phlogopite and richterite and what happens now when you have these newly formed minerals because they are so rich in water and in chlorine they lower the melting point in the subduction zone so you need only very very small partitions or very very small melt increments to form melts and all these minerals which contain the water the richterite and the phlogopite they uh, they start to melt first before the olivine of the mantle so and that makes these melts the potassic melts so rich in potassium because uh, you form all this large eolithophile elements which are uh, not very happy in the mantle there so they take the first bus or the first melt up to surface and if even if you have very very small uh, portions of melt forming they will be very very enriched in these large eolithophile elements and also in water and also in chlorine and these melts are so fertile to form porphyry copper gold or epithermal gold mineralization. So this is just an example to show you how a mantle nodule uh, looks like from a, a phlogopite rich uh, mantle uh, in a kimberlite in Arkhangelsk in Russia. And it's nicely polished this slab. You see the normally depleted mantle mainly consists of the olivines. But in the original subduction zones, a paleo subduction zone in this case, probably uh, many million years ago, uh, the elements uh, introduced by the subduction have formed this new phlogopite, which originally has not been in this mantle material. And, uh, and this is where all the volatiles and all the large ion lithophile elements in the subduction zone are hosted. And these ones, they start to melt first, long time before the olivine starts to melt. And that makes the potassic melts so enriched uh, in large eolithophile elements and volatiles such as water. So that was the introduction. Now I want to talk a little bit about the different tectonic settings of these uh, potassic intrusions. The most important one, of course, in South America is the continental arc, where um, oceanic slab is getting subducted under a continental slab then which is very important in other places where you look for porphyry copper gold uh, mineralization like in the, the islands of indonesia or papua new guinea is a so-called island arc setting which has different uh, geochemical fingerprints we will see very soon then of course the post collisional arc they become uh, increasingly important and post-collisional arc means that uh, uh, oceanic slab has long been subducted already and probably broke off already, as you can see here in picture B. And then the two continental parts of the slabs collide. And if you have a collision in nature, you form a huge orogen like the Himalaya, for example, but it's not a continuous process. So you always have relaxation phases in between this overall collisional um, event. And during this extensional uh, periods, and because the oceanic slab breaks off in the post-collisional arc setting, that opens the gap for really, really deep asthenospheric mantle input. 
And normally the subducting uh, continental slab blocks the asthenosphere off, but in post-collisional arc settings, because it, it breaks off, it opens the window. So some very deep asthenospheric mental input uh, also um, gets into the um, magmatic source. And the, the asthenosphere is usually uh, associated with really strong enrichments in so-called high field strength elements. These are elements uh, like hafnium, rubidium, strontium, and uh, niobium. These are elements which are very small, so they feel very happy in the mantle, but they have a very high charge, usually two or three plus. And this is uh, characteristic for post-collisional arcs that you have these um, higher um, finger, geochemical fingerprints of high field strength elements. Then, of course, uh, another or the fourth uh, general tectonic setting for uh, potassic intrusions is within plate. Either way, you have a, um, a graben or a rift, like in the East African Rift, for example, Kilimanjaro is a potassic volcano. And or another possibility is like Hawaii, uh, the so-called ocean island basalts, where you have this hotspot magmatism. It's usually very potassic as well. But in terms of mineralization, we can forget about the within plate tectonic settings, unless we are looking for um, iron oxide copper gold deposits. But if we want to look only for porphyry copper gold and epithermal gold deposits, within plate tectonic setting is not good. Yeah, during my um, PhD a long time ago, uh, I started to uh, define some new geochemical discrimination diagrams. And over the last two decades, I found more and more examples of large porphyry, copper, gold, and epithermal gold deposits, which are also genetically associated with these uh, high potassic rocks. So the theory became more and more confirmed by uh, new discoveries like Oyo Tolgoi and Pebble and Peshanka, just to name some of the really large ones. And just to show you that my database really consists of the more uh, potassic, mainly calc alkaline, but also shoshonitic intrusions. And I developed some geochemical discrimination diagrams because the uh, potassic intrusions they don't really fit into the old uh, discrimination diagrams from Julian Pierce, because he has developed his uh, diagrams for tholaitic basalts and for the normal um, calc alkaline intrusions. But for some reason, the potassic ones is very difficult to discriminate them on his diagrams. So when I was a postgraduate student long time ago, I had to develop my own uh, discrimination diagrams, which are specifically designed for the potassic intrusions. And uh, you can strip off the different tectonic settings, starting with the most distinct one, uh, the within plate ones. And as I mentioned before, within plate tectonic settings are very much defined by really high concentrations of so-called high field strength elements like titanium, hafnium, strontium, uh, yttrium. So it's actually very easily to strip them off from the so-called arc-related or subduction arc-related uh, intru potassic intrusion. Then is another example. You also see another high field strength element, zirconium, is very, very high in within plate settings and rather low in the arc-related uh, potassic intrusions. Then you can also distinguish from uh, or between um, continental arc and post-collisional arc settings from uh, island arc settings, because the island arc settings are very distinct because they have the lowest uh, um, concentrations of large ion lethophile elements and high field strength elements. They're really, really low in these elements. So they're usually very easy uh, to define, even when metamorphism uh, has overprinted them in hindsight, like a pebble, for example, or um, gunambla. At that time, the island arcs, they were already alive uh, in the Paleozoic a long, long time ago, but uh, you can still using the geochemical fingerprints to define them as uh, island arc related. A little bit more subtle is the discrimination between continental arcs and post-collisional arcs. And the reason for that is because they're actually very similar. The only uh, difference is that the post-collisional arcs, uh, they are a little bit more um, long lived because usually these are the ones where the um, oceanic slab 
uh, has been subduct subducted already and the two continental parts of the plates have collided. And then usually the um, subducted um, oceanic slab breaks off and it opens the gap or window to really deep asthenospheric mantle input. So the main difference between the continental arc and post-collisional arc uh, potassic intrusions is that the post-collisional arc ones have slightly higher uh, high field strength elements. And you can use that uh, to discriminate them. And continental arc ones, they usually tend to have higher cerium contents. Yeah, and in this diagram, you can see that the higher cerium uh, concentrations are usually defining the continental arc uh, potassic uh, intrusions, while the um, strong high field strength components like niobium, uh, and hafnium is actually up here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, they are more uh, defining the um, post-collisional arc intrusions because of this asthenospheric deep mantle input in their genesis. In terms of uh, mineralization and um, exploration, I want to talk about the high volatile contents and the high oxidation states of these potassic intrusions in the next chapter. And you can use their geochemical um, fingerprints uh, to define intrusive belts which have a higher potential to form um, porphyry, copper, gold, or epithermal gold mineralization just because they are more enriched in volatiles, in water, in chlorine, and they have uh, higher uh, oxidation states. And the mostly used uh, ratios, whole rock ratios, is usually strontium yttrium which is like a proxy for the water contents and indirectly also the chlorine contents because if a magma has high water contents, it usually has very high chlorine contents as well. Then the lantern euterbium ratio, which is seen as a proxy for the thickness of the crust. But this is a little bit uh, debated because there is, I have to say in South America, there is an empirical observation and that has been confirmed in the Altaid build, like in uh, Outer Mongolia, uh, in the Xinjiang province of Northwestern China, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, where there are many, many um, large porphyry copper gold deposits. There is an empirical observation that they, the really large economic porphyry copper gold deposits tend to form in areas where the crust is thicker and where it's at least 25 to 30 kilometer thick. And this lantern euterbium ratio is a proxy for that. I don't want to go too much in detail for that, but uh, the only problem which argues against it in island arcs, these ratios are naturally very, very low because the crust is naturally much, much uh, less thick, much thinner and you still form large porphyry copper gold deposits. So this is one of the ratios I have put it here because in the literature it's always considered to be a, a fertility criteria, but um, I'm a little bit more skeptical because if you are exploring for porphyry coppers in island arc settings, it's basically useless. But the following three are the more important and this is the europium, uh, europium star ratio, vanadium scandium, and the ferric ferrous iron ratio. And these latter three are very important proxies for the oxidation states for uh, potassic intrusions. And you want to have not only um, water rich intrusions, if you want to form mineralization, you also want to have highly oxidized ones because if your intrusions or your magmas, um, the parental magmas of a porphyry copper system, if they are highly oxidized, that means it suppresses the crystallization of sulfides. And sulfides in a magma chamber are like a, a geochemical vac vacuum cleaner for all the metals, the, um, the copper, the gold, and the molybdenum. And all these metals are exactly what we want to find. So if you have a um, less oxidized intrusion, you form the sulfide saturation much earlier in the magma chamber. But the problem is all the metals, they will be sucked up by the lattice of the sulfides and by in progressing um, fractionation, they will be lost to, to the cumulates because all the, um, the mafic minerals and the sulfides, they crystallize rather early during fractionation and then they sink down to the bottom of the magma chamber. And the uh, residual melt on top of the magma chamber, which is 
possible to form porphyry copper deposits is depleted in metals. So you want to prevent that. And in order to prevent that, you need high oxidation states. So the latter three ratios, as they are proxies for the high oxidation state, they are very important in uh, exploration. Yeah, just a few words uh, for the strontium euterbium ratio because it's so important as a proxy for the volatile content, especially water and chlorine. I uh, just show you a figure which I plotted using the data from uh, Ellen Cocker from her PhD thesis on El Abra. And it just shows you when you plot these ratios, strontium over euterbium against magnesium, you could also plot it against silica if you want. You just need something to um, show the fractionation trend, which is in this case going from the right to the left. And you see the strontium euterbium ratio goes up with ongoing fractionation until it reaches a point where plagioclase starts to fractionate out of the melt. And uh, as soon as plagioclase starts to fractionate, this ratio rapidly drops again. And this highest point, if you like, of uh, strontium euterbium ratios, they are the ratios uh, which are the most fertile intrusions in one particular area. But in the literature, when you read papers in petrology, you always hear, ah, well, the strontium yttrium ratio above 30 is interesting. But I have to say, uh, the more I look into these things, it is not so general because you have to define this ratio very individual for every individual intrusive belt. And to come back to Chile, for example, if you are in Kalama area, this ratio, strontium yttrium, uh, can be very high before it becomes interesting. Like at Abra, for example, you have to reach a ratio above 70. But if you go to southern Chile, for example, or in the island arcs of Indonesia, a much lower ratio like 40 or 30 can be interesting. So you can never say um, a ratio of 30 or 40 uh, strontium yttrium uh, is, um, is fertile because you have to go into your area and uh, calibrate this ratio for each individual area. And then it's very useful. Yeah, then I want to talk about the ferric uh, ferrous iron ratio. This is a very useful ratio as well. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, Ishikara, I think, or Ishikara, a Japanese um, petrologist, many years ago, I think it, this, he wrote his paper in, in the 70s already, he distinguished between the so-called ilmenite magma series, which is more reduced, and the so-called magnetite uh, magmatic suite. And as you can see, Usually um, copper and gold mineralization is associated with the more oxidizing um, magmas, which are reflected by usually uh, ferric ferrous ratios above one. The problem with that is you have to have really fresh samples because if you have oxidized samples taken from surface, uh, it can be misleading because you read much higher oxidation uh, st states than uh, the fresh rocks would give you. But if you sample really fresh samples, uh, it's very useful to, to do it. And uh, Phil Blevin, an Australian petrologist, has used it with high success in the Luckland Fold Belt, where you have a whole series of Ordovician and Silurian uh, to Carboniferous intrusions. And there, is, uh, there are known porphyry copper gold deposits like North Parks, the cluster of North Parks. There are several porphyry copper gold deposits and the Cadia cluster. And uh, they are associated with Shoshonitic, super highly potassic intrusions. And they all have the same age. They all belong to the Ordovician. And the Ordovician samples, as you can see here, uh, Phil has plotted them in circles, while all the other intrusions in the Luckland Fold Belt are little crosses. And you can see when you look at this uh, ferric ferrous ratio, you see that all the really uh, important uh, or fertile, if you like, intrusions, which are associated with Cadia and North Parks mines, they have really high um, ferric ferrous ratios sitting about here. So it works, but you have to sample really fresh samples. Then the europium-europium star ratio, that is basically based on the fact that um, the rare earth elements they're usually uh, trivalent, which means they occur as three plus ions. But only europium also can occur as a two plus or bivalent state. And that is the reason because uh, um, bivalent europium, the europium two plus, 
has the same ionic radius like calcium. And that means it can substitute the calcium in the plagioclase. And when plagioclase fractionates in the more evolved intrusions, you usually get these really deep or low uh, europium anomalies. That's because you have a lot of uh, europium 2 plus in these rocks. But if you have oxidizing intrusions, like the potassic intrusions, they tend to have higher oxidation states. Usually this effect is uh, very reduced and you have only very slight uh, negative europium anomalies because they have an excess of uh, europium 3 plus in the trivalent state. So, and this ratio uses this fact just by plotting the, um, the assay, the europium assay in PPM uh, and put that in relation to the europium value you would expect when you consider the neighboring rare earth elements like samarium and gadolinium, because uh, if they only occur in the, in the trivalent state, and if europium would only occur in the, in the more oxidizing uh, trivalent state, they should behave very, very similar because they can't uh, substitute the calcium and the plagioclase. So this ratio is a very useful one in uh, exploration. The halogen, especially chlorine and fluorine, but chlorine is probably more important when you look for porphyry copper uh, mineralization. They are very important as well because chlorine is highly reactive with practically all metals. And especially at the high temperatures when you form porphyry copper deposit, usually in temperatures between 600, 650 degrees, usually the metals they get transported in the hydrothermal fluids as so-called chloride complexes. And that makes the chlorine almost as important as the water itself. So if you have intrusions, which are primarily enriched in water and in chlorine, of course, they are more fertile and they are more prone to form mineralization. And the problem with chlorine is because it's a very light element. It's very analytically, it's very difficult to assay. And, um, and when I was a student, I always suggested to use the biotite um, phenocrysts because biotite phenocrysts, you can assay with the electron microprobe and you can, if it's well calibrated, you can uh, assay the chlorine, uh, but you can also use apatite. And biotite and apatite are both very useful indicator minerals to estimate the presence of high halogen um, contents of, of a magma or of a potassic magma in our case. Yeah, and the reason that these potassic intrusions are very enriched in water and in uh, halogens such as chlorine is that when the subducted slab uh, gets subducted, usually because of the interaction of this oceanic slab with the ocean, uh, it forms serpentinites. And these serpentinites, they get subducted and they're very water rich. It's usually antigorite. And when, the, when this antigorite gets subducted under high pressures, it starts to dehydrate. And then it introduces all its water content and uh, chlorine content into the normally depleted mantle wedge. And then in the mantle wedge, you form these new minerals I mentioned before. It's usually phlogopite, but it can also be richterite. And this, uh, or these are the hydrous minerals which are preferentially melted when you have partial melting. And they make the potassic melt so rich in volatiles uh, and in large ion lithophile elements. Yeah, some ongoing studies. This is a more modern study than when I originally proposed this. Um, more modern studies confirm this basically, like in this plot here, they plotted the halogen contents in melt inclusions from mid-ocean rich basalts and arc uh, intrusions or arc um, uh, potassic calc alkaline intrusions. And you can see when you plot chlorine against fluorine, the morb basalts, they're very low in chlorine contents, but the uh, uh, potassic calc alkaline arc basalts or tracky andesites or tracky basalts, they're very, very much enriched in chlorine. And this is one of my own uh, plots. And this basically just plots uh, uh, electron microprobe data from biotite uh, phenocrysts from potassic intrusions. And you can see that the barren intrusions contain also uh, biotite phenocrysts, but they are very much depleted in chlorine, while all the mineralized ones 
And I have to say, over the last 20 years since I wrote my PhD thesis, there are much more uh, examples have joined the list. And there are really the really large uh, porphyry, copper, gold, and epithermal gold deposits, which are hosted by potassic intrusions, they're all associated with really high chlorine contents, which you can fingerprint in their biotite phenoprests. Some Iranian professors have done that uh, very recently, just last year, a paper in uh, ore geology reviews, and they did that, the same uh, thing with some uh, porphyry copper deposits in Iran. Iran has many big porphyry copper gold deposits, and they found the same, that the barren intrusions, they were depleted in chlorine uh, in the biotite phenocrysts, and the mineralized ones were super enriched. Yeah, just to conclude everything, and uh, it was probably a little bit dry because there was a lot of uh, geochemical um, uh, diagrams. I want to show you a little picture show of some three really large examples of porphyry copper gold deposits and epithermal gold deposits. And one of them will be from a continental arc, one will be from a post-collisional arc, and one will be from an island arc. And we can go through step by step. One is the Bingham porphyry copper deposit, a really large one, Eocene in age, and located in Utah in the US. A very total or very large total resource of about 17 million tons of copper and 1 million tons of molybdenum and at least 23 million ounces of gold. The rocks, they look like that. It is a, a high potassic uh, calc alkaline monsodiorite. And when you plot it up, it actually almost falls into the Shoshonite field here. When you use the so-called Pecarillo and Taylor plot, just plotting um, the potassium against silica, they're super potassic. And in terms of fertility indicators, you can see the strontium euterbium ratio is about 35 at Bingham, which is much less or only half of the uh, Shukikamata or Radomiro Tomic and uh, El Abra deposits, which where the area, uh, we have to look for intrusions which have this ratio of about 70. So you can see this ratio is very relative and it's very useful, but only when you calibrate it for your particular area. Then the vanadium scandium ratios at Bingham are about seven, which means they are quite oxidizing. And the lantern euterbium ratio is 41, which means it's thickened crust. Yeah, just to show you some more pictures of the of the ore, actually. These are some uh, A-type veins here from Bingham. I took that from Marianne Landwings, PhD, and Kim Schröder, who is a mine geologist there. Now I want to uh, talk about another continental arc setting, which is El Abra. You all know where that li lives. Uh, El Abra is an Oligocene uh, porphyry copper gold deposit from Chile with a total resource of 1,200 million tons grading at more than half percent copper. And it is from a continental arc setting. Yeah, I probably I don't have to say so much about that. Just to show you where it plots on the Pecarillo and Taylor plot, it is a uh, high potassium calc alkaline. The normal calc alkaline ones that would be lying here. In terms of fertility ratios, you can see the fertility or the strontium yttrium ratio is very high here in this area of the world. Uh, in order to become really important, it has to be above 80. And in average, the um, mineralized intrusions from El Abra are about 85, which is double the amount of uh, Bingham, as we can see. Uh, also, the vanadium scandium ratios are much higher, more than double than from Bingham, 22. And the lantern euterbium uh, ratio is a little bit lower, but 26 for Chile is quite interesting in terms of fertility. These data are taken from uh, Cocker's PhD thesis. Yeah, I don't want to talk too much about the map. You probably know it better than me. But more importantly, just to show you some samples of the granodiorites from El Abra. I got them from Carlos Santana, who did his MSc thesis there. And um, the rocks there are um, high potassium calc alkaline in composition, and the um, petrological or petrographic rock type is granodiorite. 
And now to uh, show you an example from a post-collision arc setting, I want to talk about the famous Grasberg porphyry copper gold deposit in uh, Indonesia. Grasberg is very special because it's uh, associated with very highly potassic calc alkaline intrusions. It contains uh, 51 billion pounds of copper, about 63 million ounces of gold, and uh, over 130 million ounces of silver. And it's very young, it's Pliocene. Yeah, and maybe just to show you this beautiful view from here, which was taken by Paul Warren, he works at Grasberg and he's a mountain climber. Uh, you can see all these limestones surrounding it. So this is an area when you form porphyry copper deposits in such an environment, you expect scan deposit there. Yeah, and just to show you uh, how potassic the Grasberg samples are, I think probably part of this might be potassic alteration because when I got this data from Freeport, when I was a PhD student, I uh, still didn't go to Grasberg yet and they were so kind to send me some samples. So I would take it back. I mean, the Grasberg samples, they usually plot around here. This is the effect of potassic alteration, I have to admit. But when you go to the fertility ratios, you see the strontium terbium ratio is much lower than uh, in northern Chile. It's about 27. And the lantan terbium ratio is also much lower. It's about 16. And just to give you a little impression about the Grasberg uh, deposit, at, or in, the, in the late 70s, Grasberg, which is basically this entire mountain here, has been completely unknown that there is a large porphyry copper gold deposit because they were uh, mining the Erzberg's Khan here in the foreground. And Erzberg was very high grade. It was essentially massive bornite, but very small. But and eventually they had some problems with the water pipes and the chief geologist asked one of his mining engineers to follow it up where why the, the water pipes were clogging up and the water was not flowing anymore. And then they sliced one of the water pipes and they realized that it was uh, clogged up by native copper. And then they realized, oh dear, there must be another copper source here. It can't be all from, Erz uh, from Erzberg. And then they started to explore and they did a helicopter uh, drilling program. And the first hole which was ever drilled at Grasberg was on top of this mountain. And the helicopter drilled, I think about 100 meters and straight into porphyry copper gold mineralization. And then they realized, oh shit, this is a monster deposit here. And then over the last decades, you can see the entire mountain started to be kept or decapped. And then eventually it disappeared completely by 2012. And as we speak today, they are mining underground. So the entire mountain has been mined out already. And the uh, ore deposit actually continues. The deepest holes are, I think, about 1,100 meters, and they still end in high-grade uh, copper gold mineralization. So the resource is still going for another 30 years underground. And when you look at the ore from Grasberg, this is an underground uh, sample. Uh, it grades about 2% uh, percent copper and something which is very unique at Grasberg, you find the so-called, what they call the S-type veins, the pure um, sulfide veins with bornite or chalcopyrite. And all these brown things here are the, the biotite alteration. This rock here is completely silicified and potassic altered and has this really, really uh, high-grade copper gold mineralization. The gold usually sits in the bornite. And last not least, I want to show you an uh, example for potassic uh, intrusions, which host a really large epithermal gold deposit. And that is Lihir Island, which is a very tiny island just in the north uh, eastern part of Papua New Guinea, which is basically this area, consists, consists of about 900 islands. And one of them is called Lihir. And in the center uh, of one of the volcanoes, which make up the island, there is a large deposit, which is called Ladolam, with a total gold resource of about 56 million ounces and hosted by high potassic intrusions. And as you can see on the Pecarillo and Taylor plot, it is potassic, but it is more mafic than the previous uh, deposits we have seen. So the um, silica contents are only around 50 to 53. So they're monzodiorites, 
but high in potassium. And when you want to look at the fertility uh, indicators, the strontium yttrium ratio at Lihir is about 40, pretty high, but much less than in the Kalama area in northern Chile, but probably comparable to Bingham. The vanadium scandium ratios are eight, very comparable to Bingham. But as you can see, because it's an oceanic island arc, the lantern euterbium ratios are very low because the crust is very thin there, because you have only oceanic crust, which is known to be very thin. So this is the argument that I say the lantern euterbium ratios, they shouldn't be over evaluated. They might work in uh, mature continental arcs like the Alta Eat belt and in the South American Andes, but they don't work in the island arcs when you explore for porphyry copper. Yeah, then just a few pictures of uh, Lihi Island. The island is very small. It's about 12 kilometers from north to south. And in the widest part is probably about four and a half kilometers wide. It consists of five uh, Pliocene volcanoes. And one of these volcanoes is called Luise. And probably it was originally a strato volcano, but probably due to one of the big earthquakes which are there, because it's almost sitting under the equator. Um, during one earthquake about 100,000 years ago, it was dated, um, there was a so called sector collapse. And the whole entire strato volcano, you find it as rubble on the seafloor now. And probably at the same time, a porphyry. A copper deposit was brewing in the center, in the root under this strato volcano. But because of very rapid decompression during this uh, sector collapse, it changed to uh, high sulfidation epithermal conditions. And this entire uh, mine is essentially, essentially a high sulfidation epithermal hydrothermal breccia style deposit, which has average grades of 10 grams per ton. But the problem is, uh, uh, the gold is refractory. It sits in the pyrite of these hydrothermal breccias. And because it's so remote there, it still wouldn't make it, despite of the high gold grades overall. But very luckily for um, Newcrest, who bought the deposit now, uh, there was a late stage uh, low sulfidation epithermal overprint with this co typical colomorph uh, textures of blue quartz. And that brought some bonanza grades in there, and they are up to 120 grams. And that has made it economic. So just to uh, close up, the conclusions are the geochemical fingerprints of these hypothetic intrusive builds can be used as target selection criteria. And it might help you in exploration to find the famous needle in the haystack by looking at the favorable tectonic settings and the geochemical fingerprints of the potassic intrusions can help you with that. It, uh, it's also important to look for favorable structures, of course, or the endowment with known mineral deposits when you go to a new area, or the presence of Perkiniero workings. But the potassic uh, intrusions, they can also help you with their geochemical fingerprints to find out the fertile intrusive builds by using uh, these ratios that we just talked about. And I thank you very much for your patience. Please let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Um, gra muchas gracias, Daniel. Thanks a lot, thank Daniel. It has been a very good talk. Uh, at least me, I enjoy it a lot. So Thanks, Hesel. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Very good images. And, uh, and this, <laughs> this monkey is very funny, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, there are some questions already. So I will yeah. just let you know which are the questions. Uh, yeah. Paulina Arellano uh, asks, uh, does the strontium yttrium ratio correlates well with the lantanium iterbium ratio. What happens with these ratios in unfertile uh, magmas? Thank you in advance for your response. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they tend, they tend to correlate, that's true. But both ratios, they say something very different because uh, strontium uh, yttrium ratio is basically a proxy for the water content and the chlorine content. And the lantern euterbium ratio is just a proxy for the thickness of the crust. 
and they say something very different, but they tend to correlate. That's true. And the reason is that um, when you look for porphyry copper deposits, empirically, at least in the Andes, you can say that, and also in the Altaid belt in Kazakhstan, for example, um, they form in areas where the crust is at least 25 kilometers thick. And usually uh, the lantern euterbium ratios are higher than 15 in these areas. And they also form in, from magmas or from intrusions, which are very water rich. And that explains why these ratios usually correlate. So if, they are, if you are close to porphyry copper mineralization, both ratios are high. But don't forget, they both say something different. But because these two different things have to come together in order to form an economic deposit, that's why they can correlate. I hope that is a good answer. <laughs> No sé, Paulina, ¿te parece, ¿te parece bien o quieres profundizar en la pregunta? En caso de que quieras. <laughs> yeah, ella dice, she says that it's, it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, she can ask me an email. Ask her to send me an email, no problem. Give her my email address. Okay. I speak in uh, Spanish for her. Okay. <laughs> bueno, Paulina, si quieres le envías un correo en caso de... Así que ahí te... te... De ahí vamos a publicar el, el email. Si es que alguien más quiere hacerle preguntas también en español a, a su correo, no hay problema. Eh, después, eh, Brian Ortiz pregunta, eh, ¿qué factores permiten la reducción del estado de oxidación del europio desde europio más 3 a europio más 2 in, en la cámara magmática? What factors allow reduction of oxidation state of europium from europium plus 3 to europium uh, plus two in the magma chamber? That's a question from Ma Brian Ortiz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. But I have to say, once you are at the stage of a magma chamber, there is no process which, uh, which reduces the oxidation state again. Because usually this oxidation happens in the subduction zone already. And uh, it's a very much debated topic in petrology. But I think the most um, credible um, theory is that when you subduct all this water in a, in a subduction arc, either uh, island arc or continental arc, you bring a lot of water there. And the water in the um, mantle wedge environment under high pressures and temperatures dissociates into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And this free oxygen um, increases the oxidation state in um, in the, in the subduction setting. Because if you go to um, mid-ocean ridges, for example, their oxidation states are much lower. I mean, usually you, you in petrology, you usually um, need a scale. And usually the scale is a so-called FMQ buffer. You probably have heard about it. It's like the firelight um, magnetite uh, spinel buffer. And usually in uh, mid-ocean ridges, this is about one. But in subduction zones, it's plus two. And if you're an island arcs, for some reason, they're even more oxidizing in this subduction process, probably because the, um, the overlying crust uh, is thinner. And like, for example, at Lihi Island, the oxidation states are up to uh, plus 4.8, I found there. So the question is very good. But I have to say, the oxidation happens in the subduction wedge. And once the melts are formed and they come up into the crust and get stuck again and form a magma chamber, which needs to fractionate uh, to enrich the magma further in volatiles and in metals, by this time, you can't really change the oxidation state anymore. You can either uh, suppress the formation of sulfide, which sucks out all the metals into the cumulates, or you can uh, delay it a little bit. And that is good in order to, to make an economic deposit. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think so, but... You can Brian, also send me an email anytime. Brian, ¿quieres profundizar en la pregunta o está ok? Por favor, manda un email. Yo voy a responder en castellano. Si es que lo deseas así. Pero dice que está bien. He says that it's ok with the answer. Thank you. Uh, and thanks. He, he says. Gracias. Okay. Um, Juan Figueroa asks another question. And el pregunta, perdón, Juan Figueroa pregunta. 
ha usado eh, los indicadores de fertilidad eh, que, usted, que usted mostró en los, eh, los diferentes tipos de depósitos, como en otros tipos de depósitos tales como IOCG o estrato ligado. Entonces la pregunta en inglés, eh, have you used the fertility indicators that you shown? Eh, eh, have you used them in eh, other types of deposits like IOCG or strata bones? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Ok. Um, But yo... iron oxide copper gold deposits are usually very different. Uh, they are usually much more mafic and probably less hydrous, I would think. But it, I mean, it is, it would be a great research topic to develop some fertility indicators for iron oxide copper gold deposits. But nobody has done that yet. It's an open topic. Yes, uh, PhD research is open there. <laughs> well, um, uh, McLean Trot, uh, maybe you know him, uh, <laughs> uh, says, uh, Dr. Müller, someone yesterday had a good question. Um, is the Pathfinder sonation around an alkaline porphyry similar to the Pathfinder sonation that we see around calc alkaline porphyries, like Halley's model? I will introduce it in Spanish. La sonación de, de elementos mm -hmm. químicos de tipo Pathfinder o, eh, alrededor de los porfidos alcalinos es similar a la sonación que existe en los porfidos eh, calco alcalino como en el modelo de Halley? Mm. Well, I have to say I don't know because I haven't looked at the um, at the geochemical halo around these deposits, but I would expect that they are different because the alkaline porphyries they usually have a smaller alteration halo, like the propolytic alteration uh, around these deposits is usually very distinct, very strong, very epidote rich probably less or more epidote rich than in the Chilean uh, porphyry systems, but it's much smaller. And the reason is because the, the really the, the Shoshonitic hosted porphyry copper gold deposits like Scurius in Greece or uh, Dinky Dai in the Philippines or North Parks and Cadia in Eastern Australia or um, the ones in British Columbia in Canada, because these intrusions, the, the really alkaline ones or the Shoshonitic ones, they're usually very finger-like intrusions. Like they have a very small diameter. They have maybe 150 to 200 meters diameter, while the intrusions, the multiple intrusions usually, um, which makes a, um, a Chilean porphyry or Peruvian porphyry copper deposits, they're much wider. I mean, they're they 500, 600 meters across. So, and that, that of course, that affects uh, the alteration halo around them. They are more distinct in the Shoshonite hosted ones. But uh, if that has an effect on the geochemistry, I can't say because I have never looked at it. It's an open question. But it's a good question, definitely. Yeah, definitely, yes. It was a very good question. That is an open question until, until for the future, let's say. Yes, yes. Um, another question, Alberto Lobo Guerrero uh, says, Eric Mid Middlemost TAS diagram for intrusive rocks and his discrimination of middle alkaline, subalkaline, alkaline fields are, in my opinion, much easier and practical to use than other TAS diagrams. He used mathematically derived sigma isoplate boundaries, Middlemost, yeah, Sorry, me, 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 ¿cómo se llama? Me, me fui ahí. Uh, y yeah, ya, no. Alberto, ¿cuál es la pregunta finalmente acá? No, es un comentario. ¿Quieres expresarla tú? Es, si quieres, toma el audio. Gracias. Uh, it's a comment, really. Middlemost diagram is, is very practical. I find it more practical than what the IUGS Commission suggests to be used for plutonic rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and it is very helpful to evaluate high potassium uh, rocks. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a comment. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a good comment. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using different diagrams. You know, it's a problem in petrology. I have to say, uh, there are so many diagrams, and the problem is, I mean, nature is very gradational. And a good example are these iron oxide copper gold deposits. Like you have the ones which are iron rich and fluoride rich, like the ones in Sweden, like Kiruna. And then you have the like um, Olympic Dam in Australia, which is very copper and gold rich. And everything in between is possible. I mean, in nature, uh, nature doesn't know boundaries because in nature, everything is gradational. But because as humans, we always try to put everything in boxes because we can think better. So, I mean, in theory, there is nothing wrong to use different diagrams. The reason that I use this uh, Pecarillo and Taylor plot and the TAS plot from uh, Lemaitre is because, as you just said, because they are recommended by the IUGS uh, subcommission for petrology. That's why I use them. But it's nothing uh, wrong with, with other diagrams. You know, as long you have to be only make sure that that the guys you are talking to they use the same diagram. It is a widely used diagram, this middlemost, and it, it is quite helpful to evaluate the potassium. Uh, yeah. In particular, it, it just well. It, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's an interesting question. Well, I don't use it because in the literature it hasn't been used so much. That's the only reason, honestly. It's not because I think it's wrong or something. It's just because in the literature it's it hasn't been accepted so much. I don't know for which reasons. I can't say. But it, you are right. There's nothing wrong with using them. Ok, entonces pasamos a la siguiente pregunta, eh, que es del señor Jorge Valenzuela. Uh -huh. eh, he asks, o sea, él pregunta si el estado de oxidación y el contenido de volátiles cambia por, por la mezcla de magmas o la contaminación magmática. He asks, can the oxidation state and vol volatile content change because uh, magma mix or magma contamination? Yes. Yes, it can. Definitely. And actually, um, in the last maybe 10 years or so, it started with Chris Heinrich's team in ETH Zürich uh, because they looked at the Bajo de la Alombrera porphyry copper gold deposit in Argentina. And they they looked at uh, so-called melt inclusions because every magma has some very, very tiny melt inclusions and they haven't been affected by the um, fractionation. So they document the original state of the original primary magma from the magma chamber, at least in theory. And with the laser ablation technology, you can drill them and evaporate them and uh, measure them with the ICP-MS. And, um, and they did that and they found evidence Uh, for magma mixing uh, in the magma chamber beneath Alumbrera. And I think they did similar studies in Pebble now in Alaska, which is also a huge porphyry copper gold deposit and hosted by potassic intrusions or high potassic calc alkaline intrusions. And they also find evidence uh, that there was injection of a mafic, uh, probably gold rich asthenospheric uh, magma into a pre-existing batch of magma, which was already more evolved. So, and this definitely will have an effect on the oxidation state. Yes, definitely. Thanks for your, for your answer, Daniel. And we have another question. Uh, yes, thanks. From, <laughs> from <laughs> by, uh, Vallejos. He asks, uh, in Spanish first, uh, ¿existe un límite alto en, el, en la razón estroncio-itrio asociada con mineralización? ¿O entre más alto el, el la razón, más mineralización habrá? Uh, gracias, Daniel Miller, uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, he asks, ¿is there a high threshold, threshold in the estroncio-itrium ratio associated with mineralization? ¿O uh, if you have a higher ratio, Uh, you will get uh, more mineralization. Yeah, no, 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 you can't say that. Um, they, they all, I mean, these ratios, they only tell you that this intrusive belt, which you are looking at, you can pre-select intrusive belts and in target generation by using these uh, geochemical ratios. 
um, to say, okay, these intrusions have a higher uh, possibility to form mineralization, but you can't say whether it's economic mineralization or high grade mineralization. The good thing is you can use it and like, like big companies, they always have the problem. They get lots of submittals from third parties like BHP Billiton or Rio Tinto. They get swamped by applications and sometimes very interesting projects, but sometimes really bad ones. And they are always very uh, strapped for time to make a decision because usually the guys who have a nice offer, they want to know uh, an answer very quickly. And this target generation, and for example, using these geochemical fingerprints for the hypothetic intrusions, helps you a lot to know which intrusive belts are more, have more potential to form mineralization without saying higher potential or uh, high grade uh, mineralization, just a higher uh, potential. And if one of the submittals falls into this area, you can make a quick decision. You say, yeah, definitely, we are interested to have a look at it. And also, uh, in a big company, I mean, you, ha you have very limited resources, you have very limited field teams, and you want to send them to the best areas first. And by uh, predefining a huge area like the South American Andes into more prospective intrusive builds, you can just send your team straight into the uh, more likely uh, areas to, to, to do your normal work, to look for alteration zones and to uh, take samples and see whether there is mineralization, whether it's good enough uh, to, to do drilling. So it's very relative. It's not a guarantee that you will find mineralization, but you can focus on the better areas with a higher possibility. It's almost similar to um, the endowment. Like when you go to areas where you know there are known uh, big deposits, like when you go to the highlands of Papua New Guinea, there are Porgora, there's uh, Grasberg, there's Octedi. Sure, you have a higher chance to find something. And then when you look into it, you will realize, oh shit, there are all these really potassic Pliocene uh, intrusions there in the highlands, which are the really hot ones. And something similar will work in uh, Chile. You look for the Oligocene uh, high potassic uh, calc alkaline uh, intrusive builds. It's not a guarantee that you will find a high grade deposit, but the chances to find something there, even if you follow it up under cover, under gravel cover, or under ignimbrite cover in the north of Chile, you are in the right address. The chances that you find something there is just higher. That's what they're good for. Yeah, yeah. They, they are proxies more than They're something. proxies. Yeah. Yes. Please send me emails. I'm very happy to reply to all of you. So yeah, and I will. I would put your if you don't mind. I would put your email in the chat now. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In uh, in case you got, in case someone wants to to send a question to Daniel into his mm -hmm. email. So the last question, and I think is. Yeah, please, again, Alberto Lobo Guerrero asked for, please provide for us a list of reference using your presentation. Can, can you, yes. could, could, could you do that? Can yeah, you, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, that, 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 it, that is it. I don't... Thank you. No, no, no sé si es que alguien más quiere hacer preguntas. Está, está abierto todavía el, el micrófono, entre comillas, para hacerlo. Um, I'd like to make a comment. <clears throat> this is Alberto Lobo Guerrero from Bogota. Hello, Alberto. Dr. Mueller, I've been involved in some deposits that are hypotasic and are located in anorogenic environments. Some of these are in eastern Egypt near the Red Sea coast. Uh, major gold findings have been made by Australian and Egyptian companies in, in ring complexes that used to be volcanoes. And these are huge gold deposits associated to alkaline rocks, high potassium intrusive rock. Uh, similar deposits are being found in places like Cameroon and uh, Tanzania in, in mm -hmm. recent volcanoes. So, so this potassic environment is really fertile also in anorogenic environments. I understand there are also some recent findings in, in Central Asia, in, in, in what is part of uh, Siberia. Mm -hmm. 
So this is an, a, a, a new type of, of idea where potassium mm -hmm. magmatism holds not copper, but mainly gold uh, mineralization. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you send me the paper maybe, or some papers? There, some there are many papers. There, there are many papers about the, the Sukkar deposits in, in Eastern Egypt. There's economic geology and mineralium deposits that have six or seven papers about these Egyptian deposits. And some of mm -hmm. the others are, are recent, so there is very little public information about them. There will okay. be information in, in the less, next decade or so, but there are many recent findings of gold mineralization associated to ring complexes in alkaline rocks, which are high potassic. Uh, their mm -hmm. values in total alkaline, total sodium plus uh, potassium are eight to nine. So they're pretty high values. And yeah, sounds very interesting. Or so. So yeah. Exactly. Well, send me send me the names because I don't know so much about the Egyptian geology. Sorry. Send me the names. I would be very interested to 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 learn something about them. Sure. Well, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting to listen to you. Thank you, Alberto. Keep in touch. Um, ¿Alguien más quiere hacer preguntas? Bueno. Eh, perdón, <risa> uh, Hazel, disculpe que te interrumpo. Sí, uh, adelante. Hi, Dan. Really good talk. Hey, good hello. Good to hear your voice after so long. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. It was excellent. I was just wondering, are you um are you thinking of posting your slides on on ResearchGate or somewhere to share them or or? Yeah, I can do it. Yes. Yeah. That'd yeah, be definitely. Really great. Yes. Awesome. Well, I can send them to you. No problem. If you have Thought a Dropbox. Of... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll work something out. Yeah. Let's do it with Dropbox, and then everyone uh, can get the slides if you want. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Ok, eh, bueno, uh, I'm Daniel, there are a lot of thanks uh, in the chat for you. For Thank this you very much. It was my pleasure. So, and just I want to say uh, thanks a lot for, for, for your time, Daniel. It was a very good presentation, I would say it again. Uh, so, and... Uh, I just I want uh, to invite to everyone. Uh, sorry, sorry, your your email. I forgot it. Then, can you can you write it in the chat maybe for everyone? Uh, can you write it here? I have to see it. You, you press chat. Where down? Do you see it uh, down? No. No. I don't probably see need it. to stop. Well, I just sharing. tell it to you. I okay. just tell it to you. Oh, it no, is Alberto Lobo posted it. Daniel Mil, Mil, nah. Daniel Muller three three. Then the yeah. ad symbol yahoo.com. And all written together. Yeah. Daniel Muller three three at symbol yahoo.com. Yeah, okay, super. So yeah. So the, 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 your, I hope that we will use Dropbox or something to share your yes. flag. Yes, definitely. Can you look after that? Can you organize it, you or Mac? And then I just download it on the Dropbox and then everyone can download it if you want. Yes, no problem. No problem. We will also maybe, some literature. Uh, in, the, in the page that we have in LinkedIn uh, or in, uh, there, there will be the repository or something something yes in instagram we will share the link there okay and uh, so again thanks a lot um i think that in the vamos a voy a cambiar el idioma en la tarde vamos a tener una presentación la última presentación del ciclo de charlas eh, va a presentar nuevamente maclean quien tuvo la primera parte en una excelente charla ayer y que hoy día en la tarde eh, va a hacer una especie de práctico o 
de cómo trabajar datos de geoquímica que dan información sobre alteración en pórfidos principalmente, eh, eh, cómo trabajar esa información mediante, mediante un programa que era el que presentó ayer llamado KNIFE, Nice. Bueno, no, me acuerdo, no, no me acuerdo exactamente, Marlín, a lo mejor me lo puede escribir ahí, eh, y, eh, el, y que vamos a, en el cual va a ir paso a paso explicando NIME. Nine. Así que ojalá, por favor, todos si, quienes quieran participar en la tarde, ojalá tenerlo instalado. Ahí Marlín puso en el chat el, el, ¿cómo se llama? la página, y eh, para que podamos ir avanzando paso a paso mientras él lo va explicando. Eh, es, es, la charla es a las, a las 6 de la tarde hora chilena, 4 de la tarde hora peruana, así que quedan todos invitados a esa presentación. Así que nuevamente muchas gracias Daniel y, y que estén todos bien. Muchas gracias. Chao. Muchas gracias a ti y a todos.